And I'm going to give you a talk today on the status of dengue vaccines. And I'd like to go over a little bit about the immunity, immunology and immunopathology of dengue because it's very critical in understanding dengue vaccines and vaccine development. We're going to review the safety of the first licensed dengue vaccine, Denvaxia, and we're going to review what we learned from that trial, which was incredibly informative for dengue vaccine development. And then I'm going to update on other vaccine candidates that have been licensed or are moving toward licensure. So I put up here really important points because these are the points that I think are so essential to understanding dengue and dengue vaccine um, development and live vaccine development uh, writ large. So I don't know if Claire Ann and her immunology talk really made this point, but for live attenuated vaccines to work, they need to infect and they need to replicate within the host because they are using your host machinery to sort of as that vaccine factory to produce more of the vaccine and induce a stronger um, response. And the other beauty about live vaccines, which is important to remember, is that because they infect cells, um, they're processed and presented in both the context of MHC class one and class two, which has the potential to have greater memory, longer duration of memory. And that's really important. Partial immunity to dengue is bad, and I'll tell you why that is in a little bit, but please don't forget that. Partial immunity to dengue is bad. And then dengue vaccine is complicated, and I'll go through why that is, but it's important to remember that each virus is different. These are like your children. They're each different. They behave differently, and different attenuation strategies that work for one virus, one dengue serotype, may not work for the others. So this is why partial immunity to dengue is bad. There are four individual dengue virus serotypes, and the immune response to one does affect the immune response uh, uh, to the other and can increase your risk for more severe disease. So we think that you have lifelong protection against symptomatic or severe reinfection with that same dengue virus serotype, but you only have short-term cross-protection from one serotype to another. And not only do you just have short cross-term protection, that dengue infection that you had first and the immune response to that first infection can predispose you to more severe disease with the second infection. And we think that that's mediated by something called antibody-dependent enhancement of infection. So what do I mean by that? Well, down here, you may have antibody from your first infection, which might be a dengue 2 infection. And now you're being infected with dengue 1 here. That dengue 2 antibody can bind to that dengue 1 virus. But because the antibody is poor quality, it doesn't really recognize the epitopes. It doesn't bind tightly or it doesn't recognize enough epitopes. It doesn't neutralize the virus. And not only does it not neutralize the virus, but it also acts almost like a chaperone. So that antibody virus complex can then bind to the FC gamma receptors on monocytes and macrophages, and the virus gets in through that pathway and can escape the innate immune response, allowing the virus to replicate to higher titer. We get a higher viral load released, and we get increased production of mediators of more severe disease, such as the non-structural protein 1, as well as different complement factors that can lead to vascular permeability, and more disease. Now, what's interesting is that secondary infection does appear to broaden your immune response so that your third and fourth infections are less severe. So we don't see a lot of hospitalizations or severe disease with your third or fourth infection. We think that's because the immune response may broaden to highly conserved, highly neutralizing epitopes. We don't know, though, if simultaneous infection with four viruses induces that same broadened immune response as sequential infection with multiple viruses. So that's important to remember as well. So this is a point I always say when we talk about a dengue vaccine, oh, we have a dengue vaccine, we're expecting a dengue vaccine. It's really four individual vaccines. And each of those four individual vaccines needs to infect and they need to replicate within the host. We think because of antibody-mediated enhancement of infection, we need to protect against all four serotypes because all four serotypes can cause the full spectrum of disease, including severe dengue. Neutralizing antibody has been the gold standard of measurement of immunogenicity for dengue vaccines. 
but I'll show you it is not predictive of a successful vaccine. And it led us down the wrong path for many, many years. And just briefly, animal models don't really replicate the disease that we see in humans. So what I'm showing you here is Denvaxia, or CYD, which stands for chimeric yellow fever dengue. It's four viruses on this... Oop, back. Four viruses on this yellow fever background here. So we have the pre-MNE proteins of dengue 1, 2, 3, and 4 on the yellow fever 17D background. All of the non-structural proteins here are yellow fever, not dengue. And we know that more than 85% of CD8 epitopes of dengue are located in the non-structural proteins. So we do not get a good CD8 T cell response to dengue after vaccination, but we do get a good CD8 response to yellow fever. This vaccine requires three doses to be given over 12 months, which is unusual for a systemically administered live attenuated vaccine. And there have been several efficacy studies that have been done, and I'm going to discuss the phase 2B study first. So this was CYD23, and these are data from CYD23 that showed excellent seroconversion or seropositivity, 95 to 100% of volunteers sero became seropositive to dengue 1 through 4. The neutralizing antibody titers were considered very, very high. And when these results had come out, we had two phase three clinical trials already ongoing, CYD14 in five countries in Asia, CYD15 in five countries in Latin America. These results came out. We thought the vaccine was highly immunogenic. It was a blueprint for success until we saw the efficacy results. And the efficacy, again, this is a small study in Thailand only in kids four to 11. The overall efficacy was 30% and it was not statistically significant. So now you're the president of the company and you see these results. What are you going to do now? You have two ongoing phase three clinical trials. Keep going. Hold your breath. Stop the trial. Well, this goes back. This is interesting. This goes back to Peter Smith's lecture. Remember when we had the saline versus um, albumin and at first it looked really good. And then as we went on and we got more people, didn't look so good. So luckily we did continue. Sanofi did continue. Um, the phase three clinical trials, mostly to follow follow volunteers for safety and see what we get. And it's interesting. We do have better FC against this is virologically confirmed dengue of any severity. It's statistically significantly efficacious. We're looking at different age groups in these different regions, and that'll come back in a minute. But what we do see here is efficacy against hospitalization and severe disease that is very good and would make a very important public health impact. What overwhelms countries in dengue seasons is people coming for hospitalization. Their health care system shut down because so many people are coming to the hospital. And if you can prevent 67% or 80% of your hospitalizations, you have made a significant public health impact. And that's something to keep in mind. How... However, when they looked a little bit deeper in the data, and unfortunately in this study, only about 10% of volunteers had a pre-vaccination blood sample. But they wanted to understand these efficacy results a little bit better. And what you can see is there's a clear difference in efficacy depending on whether or not you had dengue before, you were seropositive to dengue at baseline, or whether you had not had dengue, you were seronaive. And what this showed is that the vaccine did not have significant efficacy in children who were seronegative to dengue before they were vaccinated. It works great if you've already had dengue, doesn't work well if you haven't dengue, had dengue before. And not only does it not work particularly well in people who haven't had dengue, there was a safety signal that was observed in year three of the trial. One thing that I didn't mention about ADE is it appears that your risk for ADE after your primary infection starts to begin around two to three years after your primary infection and, continue, and can continue, we think, for the duration of your lifetime. So in year three of the trial, two years after the last dose of vaccine, there was a safety signal where the relative risk for hospitalization was 7.45 in kids who were two to five-year-olds two to five years old at the time of vaccination if they received the vaccine compared to placebo. The vaccine increased the risk of hospitalization two years after they were vaccinated if they got vaccine. 
a post hoc analysis determined that there was not an increased risk. This increased risk went away when you reached the age of nine or older. So originally, um, the WHO looked at the data. We said we have variable efficacy against virologically confirmed dengue by age, by serostatus, by serotype. Very good efficacy against hospitalized dengue and severe disease, but we did see an increased risk of severe disease in year three for the youngest kids in the trial who got vaccine. So in 2016, the SAGE Working Group recommended use for this vaccine in highly dengue endemic areas only for those who are nine and older at the time. So trying to minimize that risk of more severe disease, recognizing that the population benefit outweighs an unknown individual risk. Because we didn't know at the time, was that risk because kids were two to five or was that risk because they were dengue naive? We didn't have enough samples um, pre-vaccination to make that determination. But WHO said to the company, go back, develop an assay, and try to figure this out. And they did. And they figured out that that risk for more severe disease was related to serostatus of vaccination. So if you were dengue naive at vaccination, you had a higher risk of being hospitalized in year three than placebo group. And so the guidance was changed in 2017 to adopt pre-vaccination testing strategy. What happened? Well, these were the, um, 2016 was the uh, original recommendation, and the Philippines started a demonstration project of Denvaxia in April of 2016. In November of 2017, Sanofi relabeled their vaccine for use only in those children who had already had dengue. And there was a national scandal in the Philippines around Denvaxia saying that Denvaxia is killing children, that they should prosecute Senafi, and they should prosecute all of the um, investigators. And the vaccination rates, not for Denvaxia, the vaccination rates in the country, in the Philippines, went from 93% to 32%. This was primarily politically motivated. I could give a whole lecture on it, but I won't. I don't have time today. But the bottom line is this risk, this communication was not made the the communication that, oh, yes, we further investigated this and we realized that it's due to serostatus. It wasn't new information in terms of what the risk is necessarily, but it was communicated um, very casually and nobody anticipated this response in the Philippines. And it really became a scandal and affected vaccination rates um, in the Philippines and also dengue vaccine trials everywhere. And so we have to be very careful how we communicate. We have to think proactively about how we're going to communicate risk and make sure that we're very transparent in the risks that, that are there. So why did this happen? As I said, we need to ensure that each component of a live vaccine infects and replicates. And how do we know that each of the four components of Denvaxia infect and replicate? because they weren't studied as individual components. They were only studied in the tetravalent admixture. And how do we know the antibody titers that we're measuring are really from the individual virus or are they cross-reacting from the other dengue virus serotypes that are contained within the vaccine because we see a lot of cross-reactive or heterotypic antibody? Well, there's different ways we can look with a live vaccine. We can see are there symptoms, are there side effects, but again, we have four viruses, so we can't attribute what those side effects, you know, to which virus those side effects belong. Can we look at antibody titers? Well, I said earlier they're cross-reactive, so we can't tell if they're induced by one particular virus or if they're induced by another. But we can look at viremia, and we can vaccinate with a live vaccine and see if we can recover that vaccine virus from, in the case of dengue viruses, from the blood. So what happens when we do that? So these are different studies that were done by Sanofi of different um, vaccine formulations or schedule. And this one here at the bottom was in the lot-to-lot -lot consistency study. So is looking at the actual vaccine that was given. And what we see, this is by PCR in parentheses, what we see is Dengue 4 is dominant. Dengue 4 was recovered from 44% of vaccinated volunteers. Dengue 3, only from 12.6. Dengue 1, only from 7.4. And the Dengue 2 component 
was not recovered from any vaccinated volunteers. So this tells you you have an imbalance in the infectivity or in interference, if you want. I don't like the term interference because they weren't studied as individual monovalent viruses. So we don't know if this is really interference or over attenuation of the different components. So Eric Vinda de Silva, who's a colleague at um, UNC in North Carolina, did a very elegant study where he's trying to determine, do we have homotypic or do we have heterotypic antibody? So he depletes the serum with using three of the four serotypes and then measures the antibody to that fourth serotype and sees if there's any antibody left. If there's no antibody left, that means it was all cross-reactive antibody that he was detecting um, in the undepleted serum. And what we see here is that, again, Dengue 4 gives you homotypic antibody. But when we look at the level of homotypic neutralizing antibody here in panel T in, in panel B or the percentage of homotypic antibody in panel A, we see dengue four is dominant. We see very little dengue one and two or three. And it and it um, shows us that again, most of dengue four is homotypic, particularly dengue two and three are mostly cross-reactive and not homotypic. And so a poor quality antibody response. Um, and it tells us that Denvaxia is primarily a Dengue 4 vaccine. And that means when you vaccinate, it's acting as your primary infection. When you get a natural uh, infection subsequently two or three years later, it's acting as a secondary infection. And we may be seeing enhanced viremia and more symptomatic severe disease in people who were dengue naive at the time of vaccination. So I'm going to move on to our second licensed vaccine, which is Takeda. This has been licensed in a few different countries. It's received uh, licensure by EMA. This is two doses given three months apart. The phase three study was in kids age four to 16. I want you to note that we have a full length dengue two component here. And the other three components are chimeric viruses on that dengue tube background. And so we have 16 dengue proteins compared with eight, and we at least have the non-structural proteins of dengue two. Uh, the phase three clinical trial enrolled kids four to 16 years of age in eight countries, 27.6% were dengue naive. One thing that came out of the Senefi trial is every dengue trial now, you have to have a pre-vaccination sample to test for serostatus prior to vaccinate. Oh, that 27.6% of the kids were dengue naive at the time of enrollment. Now we're going to look at viremia following a single dose. And I will tell you, this is from the phase two study. This is not the final formulation. Um, viremia was not measured with the final formulation, but these are the viremia data that we have. And again, you'll notice by PCR, dengue 2 is dominant. This is the full length dengue 2 component. Chimerization is highly attenuating. And you can see that the chimeric viruses were not able to be recovered post-vaccination. The vaccine was reformulated mostly because there was a very low dengue 4 titer uh, post-vaccination. So the company reformulated the vaccine to reduce the amount of dengue 1, 2, and 3 in the final formulation and increase the amount of dengue 4, but we don't have viremia data with this new formulation. What we do see is that the dengue 2 antibodies are about a hundredfold higher in dengue naive people than um, antibodies to dengue 1, 3, and 4. So the antibodies induced by this vaccine are really dominated by the dengue 2 component. So what about depletion assays? And again, Aravinda de Silva used the same assay. And what he's showing is that, again, dengue 2 is dominant. It has the most homotypic antibody. But we see that most of the depleted samples indicate that neutralizing antibody was predominantly heterotypic for dengue 3 and 4. And I think you'll see that in the efficacy results that I'm going to show you in a minute. So the efficacy results of this vaccine have been released. And what you see is efficacy in year one, year two, year three, and then through 36 months. And what you see is excellent efficacy in year one in both seropositives and seronaives and against virologically confirmed dengue and hospitalization. Fantastic efficacy results um, in both those groups. But in the seronaives, you see waning efficacy with each year. 
And even in the seropositives, we see some waning year by year um, in efficacy against virologically confirmed dengue. And then by year three of the trial, we don't see significant efficacy against hospitalization in year three following vaccination. And then when we look at efficacy by serotype, again, we see stark differences. Dengue 2 is, is really strong efficacy through each year of the, of the study in both seropositives and seronaives. Dengue 1, good efficacy um, in seropositive and seronaives, but again, waning over time. And by year 3, we don't have statistically significant efficacy to Dengue 1 in the seronaives, and we have waning efficacy in seropositives. We never had efficacy against dengue three in the seronaives or against dengue four in the seronaives. I do want to put up the caveat, there were very few cases of dengue four in this study. But if we just look at the dengue three, we see loss of efficacy even in seropositives by year three of the study. So we're seeing waning efficacy over time. When we look at vaccine efficacy by hospitalized for hospitalized virologically confirmed dengue in year three, what we see is Vaccine efficacy against hospitalized dengue in seronaives was not significant. And I will tell you, it was driven by dengue 3. So there were a lot of dengue 3 cases in year 3 of the study that drove this. And we can see that there was not efficacy against hospitalized dengue 3 in seropositives or seronaives in year 3 of the study. And there was an excess number of hospitalized cases in the vaccine group compared to the placebo group. Now, a lot of those cases occurred in a single country, um, Sri Lanka, but regardless, what we're seeing is lack of efficacy against hospitalized dengue, dengue three in year three of the study with an excess number of cases of uh, hospitalized dengue in year three. So again, excellent efficacy against biologically confirmed dengue and dengue naive subjects for about two years post-vaccination. Varying efficacy by serotype and serostatus, declining efficacy over time, and lack of efficacy, significant efficacy against virologically confirmed dengue 3 and dengue naive subjects or overall efficacy against dengue 4. And then lack of significant efficacy against hospitalization in year 3 and seronegative volunteers. And again, this was driven by dengue 3. And we did see an excess number of hospitalized cases of dengue three in the vaccine group in year three. But again, at very good efficacy through two years against hospitalization, potential for an extremely beneficial public health impact. And how we balance this risk and public health impact, I think is gonna be discussed quite a bit. So the last vaccine I'm gonna talk about, and full disclosure, I've worked on this vaccine for 23 years, is TB003 or DEN03. It was developed by the US National Institutes of Health it's a single dose vaccine. It is three full length dengue viruses, one chimeric virus. We all have to have a chimeric virus with 32 dengue proteins. This vaccine um, has the technology has been licensed to many different companies, but the company that's farthest along is the Institute Butantan in Brazil. And they initiated a phase three clinical trial in 2016. 47% of vaccine recipients were sero naive prior to vaccination, and they've just released their interim, uh, two-year interim analysis results, which I'll go over in a minute. This is the um, overall efficacy was 79.6%, 89.5% efficacy against Dengue 1, 696 against Dengue 2. When we look at seropositives, very good efficacy in seropositives, very good efficacy in seronaives, lower efficacy against Dengue 2, that chimeric. Chimerization is highly attenuating, but still very good efficacy against dengue 2 in seronaives. There were not any cases of severe dengue in the first two years, and there was only dengue 1 and 2 circulating uh, in Brazil during the first two years of the trial. So we don't have efficacy data against dengue 3 or 4. I'm going to show you some data, which leads me to believe efficacy against 3 and 4 would be even better, but we won't know until we see it. We've been fooled before. So this is the viremia data for TB003 by PCR, which um, is not in parentheses, and by culture infectious virus, where we take the serum and we put it on tissue culture cells and we look for um, viremia. And what you can see here is 
by PCR very balanced viremia across each of the four serotypes. By infectious culture, we see again, dengue two is more attenuated. It infects less well than dengue one, three, or four. Dengue three and four appear to be those two strains that infect, um, infect the best with dengue one and two being a little bit less, but particularly dengue two. Um, so I think this viremia data is reflective of the efficacy data, certainly that we saw against dengue one or two. And when we look at antibody de um, depletion assays, Aravinda de Silva looked at antibody depletion. And again, what we see is less homotypic antibody to dengue one and two, but still about 40%. And then as we go to dengue three and four, 60 and 80% of the antibodies recovered um, are homotypic to dengue one, two, three, and four. So very good homotypic antibody response we saw here. Now I'm going to show you a study where we actually asked, is homotypic antibody as important as we think it is? And so to do that, we developed a trivalent admixture that has the viruses, the dengue one, dengue three, and dengue four viruses from our tetravalent vaccine. And we gave it as a trivalent admixture. And we challenged six months later with our dengue two challenge virus. And then we compared those results with the results of our tetravalent vaccine followed by challenge. This is the trivalent. You can see the only difference between the tetravalent and the trivalent are the pre &E of dengue 2. All of the non-structural proteins are the same because the dengue 2 is a chimeric on the dengue 4 background. So the only difference in antigenic presentation is the pre E of dengue 2 between the tetravalent and the trivalent. And when we look at results, what we see is the tetravalent induced 100% protection against dengue 2 challenge at six months. We could not detect virus by PCR or by culture. We saw a different story with the trivalent. So E is the only difference between these two. We had 80% breakthrough cases by PCR in the trivalent. And we had 20, um, we had 20, or I'm sorry, 70% efficacy when we looked by culture. So when breakthrough infection occurred in 80%, not all of those went on to become infectious. So whether it is, is CD8 T cell re response that's, that's limiting the ability of that breakthrough virus to become infectious or whether it's other factors, what we do know is that the peak viremia titer between the trivalent challenge virus and the placebo was not different. So if breakthrough occurred, the virus replicated to his high titer, but it took longer and it was cleared faster. So part of the immune response is able to clear that. Now, whether that's, we think it's probably related to the cellular immune response because we do have good cellular immunity to that. But if you don't have homotypic antibody, you have breakthrough infection. It's critical to prevent infection. So these are our lessons learned. Homotypic antibody is important for protection against infection. Whether or not the cellular immune response can clear that infection up after it occurs, those are studies that we're doing. But if you want to prevent infection, you need homotypic antibody. And then just overall, the lessons we learned really in a, in a nutshell is that chimerization is highly attenuating. And some of these viruses may be over attenuated. And the only way we're going to know that is if we check and look and see, can they infect, can they replicate? For the vaccines to induce a homotypic immune response, they must infect and they must replicate. And we need balanced homotypic immunity to protect against all four dengue virus serotypes. I think T-cell immunity is very important in mitigating disease once it occurs. I think we need more studies to do that. Um, but I think we have to really look and make sure that any live vaccine that we're giving, particularly for dengue vaccines, each of the components is able to infect and replicate. And I'm going to stop there and take any questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is Catherine. Um, could you make a, um, a vaccine that doesn't include any chimerization that four unique strands. And is there any interest in doing that given the results around chimerization? So, yeah, I think, I think absolutely you can. And I think, um, you know, we have to think back. I will say one of the luxuries of working with the NIH is that they will do 
30 different studies to come up with a good vaccine. So I didn't have time to show this, but we looked at many, many different monovalent um, candidates and um, went with, finally chose those four. We think, um, you know, and, and with the manufacturer, the manufacturer does not have the luxury to do that. So I think with the manufacturers, they had a product they looked in early phase clinical trial, given what we knew at the time or what we thought we knew at the time, and saw very good immune responses and elected to, to move forward with those candidates. I think it's difficult to come back now and change that. Um, I think, you know, the Bhutan vaccine, we need to follow up. They have a five-year safety follow-up. I think it will be very interesting to see if we start to see waning, particularly if Dengue 2 um, you know, so far those data look very good, but we don't know. Um, and I think had we not, for instance, if we hadn't seen any viremia with the dengue two component, um, I'll give you an example. The finalized dengue three component, we had a dengue three, four chimeric. It was over attenuated. It infected only 20%. We went back and we did a dengue three delta 30. It was under attenuated. It made people, it was more reactogenic. So then we went back again and made another 30 nucleotide deletion in the three prime untranslated region and got a full length dengue three that had a good balance. So yes, but you need to have the resources to do that. And it's not easy. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm curious is, do you know? Have you gone into in vitro studies to find out whether it is a transcription, translation? What does it that the chimeric always fail? It must be something with the antigen presentation. So it has to do with, again, when you make that chimeric, it has to do with the replication machinery in vivo being able to make enough virus and being able to sort of outpace the innate immune response that may, or it may just be, that because it's so weak, if there's any innate immune response, it just doesn't have time to replicate. Because how the replication machinery affects the interaction of all these proteins, and it's different for each virus. Like I said, we had a 3-4 chimeric that was over attenuated. It didn't work. Our 2-4 infected 100% of people. The 3-4, 20% of people. It's completely unpredictable. And it has to do with just the, the machinery just doesn't work well. We did a Zika on the dengue four background, it was over attenuated. It only infected 20% of people. A West Nile dengue four infected 100% of people. So it has to do with that whole replication machinery. Yeah. Hi, my name is Trina. I, back on the Dinvaxia slide where you were showing vi viremia, um, the references you had at the bottom of the table were all from like, 2011 or so, which would have been before the larger trials. And so it was already known that it mostly, you know, uh, I remember from the one dengue four, did that not raise any red flags? So again, we have to, we have to go in our time machine and go back to what was dogma at the time. And dogma at the time, dogma at the time was we're seeing neutralizing antibody to all four serotypes. So everything is good. And it's just that it's not sensitive enough. These assays just aren't sensitive enough to pick up um, viremia. And so we're still seeing really good neutralizing antibody responses. So it's all going to work out. It was the dogma at the time. We have learned so much from this study about dengue, not just about vaccine development, but about dengue vaccine development. Yeah. Uh, here, the viremia is measured at day 7 and 14. Do you think that day 7 is a little too early? So okay. that's another great point. And all of these, I will tell you, all of these viruses, they have different replication kinetics too. So yes, I think if they had measured more frequently, and they did, if you look at 4 is the most important reference because that was the lot-to-lot -lot consistency study. And they measured at day 6, 8, 10, and 14. 20 is probably too late. But yeah, we see... We see viremia onset with um, the vaccine viruses probably around day eight or nine and lasting till day 16. But yeah, you need to do frequent measurements. And again, that's expensive because you have to bring volunteers back in and you have to draw their blood and it's expensive. So, you know, we were able to do it with partnership with the NIH because we were looking at these vaccines sort of as a model for dengue infection and what is the kinetics of viremia of dengue infection. 
um, but it's very expensive. Yeah. Any T cell data from these three studies? Yeah, so I can tell you. Um, so Takeda makes good uh, CD8 T cell response to dengue 2 with some cross reactive. We found with the chimeric, when you give the individual viruses, you get primarily a homotypic CD8 T cell response. When you give them all together, the CD8 T cell response actually hones in on cross-reactive epitopes. So you get very good CD8 response to all four serotypes. So you get about a tetravalent CD8 T cell response, which is conserved. Those epitopes are conserved across all of the four serotypes. So you really hone in on conserved epitopes as opposed to relying on just epitopes from one virus or the other. Just a question. I mean, you nicely stated how complex and how also time intensive the development was. So is there any other platform, especially obviously mRNA, that you see ever kind of coming in here? So I think, you know, what I really like about the mRNA platform to me, and, and this is very general, but it presents antigens like a live attenuated vaccine would, right? So in the con, if you have a good mRNA vaccine and you get good intracellular, um, uh, production of your antigen and it's pro processed in the context of, of MEC class one and two, you could have very good humoral CD4, CD8 response. I think. An mRNA vaccine should include one or more non-structural proteins because I really believe for dengue, those non-structural proteins are key to clearance. So I think it is absolutely a possibility. We start to get into a numbers game with the number of antigens, particularly you have, you know, for the envelope protein, you need pre-M to begin with in the cell to sort of, um, the envelope is very spiky in its immature form with pre-M, and it goes through the ER, and then it goes through a very uh, low pH phase just before it's released, and PR is cleaved off, and the, and the particle becomes quite smooth. So you would have to include pre-PR or pre-M in that construct. So you'd have to have pre-M, E, and probably at least one non-structural protein, which may then mean you're up to 12 mRNA constructs, which may not be a problem. We're getting better and better at mRNA, but I do think it complicates things. But I do think there are other platforms. As you mentioned that, uh, Pandiri from Thailand, so you mentioned that um, you need uh, four serotype to be strong in order to, to have a protective effect. Would it be possible to prime and boost with another vaccine? For example, start with Vaccine and then follow up with Takeda. Would it be possible in terms of immunology? Is it will be recognized if it's construct from a different platform? So those studies have been done in an animal model, and yes, it works. It's complicated though from a vaccine introduction because then you're using two different products, and you have to have two companies working together to ensure that they, you have enough of each product. So in theory, yes, that would work. I think in practice it would be extremely difficult. But it did work in an animal model. Absolutely. So what is, is there a role for, for boosters here? Because if you're losing the protection at three years, would you, but then, or, or conversely though, does it just delay the, the, the peak risk time. Yeah. So that's a great question. And, and I will say Takeda has introduced a booster, um, in their phase three study at year four, four and a half. Um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, ideally, you know, if you had natural boosting going on that, and I think if you're still in an endemic area, that's certainly, that's, that's something that's going to be seen. But I think if you're truly, um, not seeing good efficacy, particularly by year three, I think that does bring in the question, should you boost? Because you're going to get, you know, we can't necessarily predict which serotypes are circulating where. Um, so I do think if you want to maintain efficacy, you may need boosting. But I think the that is only going to be, that story is only going to be told with time and probably post licensure until we see what the real real world experience with this vaccine, with these vaccines are 
because as was shown by Annalise earlier, the clinical trial results are very, you know, they have discrete endpoint efficacy, and we may not know what the off-target effects or what the broader effects or the nonspecific effects are. So I think it's really too early to tell. Yeah. After the scandal in the Philippines with the dengue vaccine, is there any country which is using dengue vaccine as routinely? And number two, how practical is it to do serostatus prior to a vaccination program? So it's very difficult, and no country right now is using Denvaxia routinely for a couple reasons. One, it's three doses. So, you know, in theory, if you're only giving that vaccine to people who are seropositives, you probably only need one dose. But we don't have a clinical trial to show that, and that's part of the problem. So we have to maintain the three dose over a year, which is very difficult. Two, the pre-vaccination strategy makes it even more difficult because we don't yet have a good test with high enough specificity. People are working on it. I think they're very close, but then that increases the cost of the vaccine. And I think with the Takeda vaccine coming along and then other vaccine manufacturers um, coming along, I think that then Vaxia likely will be phased out over time if these other vaccines get licensed in um, seronaives and seropositive people, I think then then there's really no advantage to to Denvaxia, and I think it probably will fade away. Yeah. Um, are the clinical data for Takeda sufficient to decide or to make a determination on whether we would need pre-testing? That is a question for the regulators. Um, I think it's a really, really tough question, and I'm not – it's a really, really tough question because the benefit of that vaccine in the prevention of hospitalization and severe disease is huge. What I what I would say is, you know, I think we just have to message very, very well, and we have to make sure that, that any risk that is there is transparent, is discussed, and is communicated very, very well because I do think the risk – is likely small, um, and the prevention of hospitalization is likely very, very great. And the question is, you know, are people willing to take on that individual risk without testing for the benefit of society, which has a great benefit? And the benefit would be very, very large. So I think it is a tough um, problem to tackle. But I think, again, transparency is really a key. I think we have time for maybe one more. Go ahead. Just the last one, and on this point, do you think there is a potential for a pilot-like program similar to what RTSS has done in free countries to better understand, you know, these uh, you know, severity outcomes and, and whether that could be possible for dengue? I think it's a necessity. I think any den- dengue vaccine that gets licensed, we will need to do something like that just to follow up the long-term safety safety risk, because I think it's really important for confidence. So I think absolutely those studies should be done. Yeah. Great. Oh, one more, Reza. We still have uh, a minute. Thank you. Uh, there is any uh, evidence about cross-protection of this uh, vaccine against other viruses? Or so I want to do those studies. I want to do dengue vaccine, Zika challenge, Zika challenge, dengue vaccine. So, you know, it's interesting. We did see a drop, a significant drop in dengue um, epidemiology following Zika, dengue cases following the Zika outbreak in 2016, but it hasn't been sufficiently studied. And I think, you know, one of the things that we do want to look at is if we have a really good tetravalent dengue vaccine, maybe we can protect against Zika, but only time will tell. Thanks.